All right, how's it going? It's good to see everyone back with us here again. You know, we just been in this season of, of kind of going through our values at Zeal. <clears throat> you know, we, we just love what God's doing here. We love that the lost are being saved as we're passionately pursuing all that God has for us. And, you know, we just want to run after him and run after all that he has for us with, with a passion, with an urgency, with, a, with an ever-present thought process of oh, I'm driving forward, I'm moving forward, I'm going after him with all that I have. You know, one of, the, one of the biggest values that we actually have at Zeal is that we dream big. We dream big. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Who taught you how big you could dream? Just take a second, ponder it. Who taught you how big you could dream? You know, for all of us, <clears throat> I actually fully believe that this is learned that this is learned. And, and, you, and you think about it this way, right? You think about your, your parents, your mom, your dad, your relatives, your family, your, your teachers, your, your coaches, friends, TV, media, social media, all these different areas that influence how you think and how you believe. And for, for that sense, for what, for what you believe. You know, so when, when a young kid, right, four or five years old comes in and says, oh my gosh, I would love to be a firefighter. I'd love to be a police officer. I'd love to be the president. I'd love to be a, uh, an astronaut, whatever it is. Often that reality is defined by who they're surrounded by. It's often defined by if my daughter who's, who's four years old comes to me and says, dad, I want to be the president of the United States. What she thinks next about that is probably going to be defined by my reaction to what she just said to me. You know, if my reaction is, honey, <laughs> let me sit you down. Let's have a conversation about this. That's never going to happen. And this is why. Well, there's never been a, a woman who's been the president of the United States before. Uh, it's just not likely. It's probably not going to happen. You should give up on that dream. You should move on. If that was my reaction to her dream... There's a very good chance, because I'm a person of influence in her life, I'm her dad, she would believe me and say, okay, I guess that's not for me. Uh, maybe I should try and find something else. But if my, if my posture towards her dream is, you know what, honey, that's awesome. That's a great dream. Let's do that together. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to help you fulfill that dream. And, and I, I take her hand and I say, let's go after that. We start, start moving after her. She's going to have this hope and belief inside of her that I want to do this. My dad believes in me. And I'm teaching her how big she can actually dream. One of the other ways is through history. That when we understand and know history, it can actually teach us and help shape what we believe and how big we dream. If you want to turn with me to, to 2 Kings, 2 Kings, we're going to be looking at the life of King Hezekiah in, in chapters 18, 18 through 20, and it's also in Isaiah 36 to 39, and the King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah ruled over Judah during a period of time where the nation of Israel was divided. There was Israel, and then there was Judah. It was two divided kingdoms. There were two separate kings, and Hezekiah was king over Judah. Uh, and during this time, the Assyrian Empire, the Assyrian armies, were, were basically taking over the world, um, piece by piece by piece. And the Assyrian king had now set his eyes on Judah. And we see this in 2 Kings 18 through 20. We see this back and forth. The threats of the enemy. And yet King Hezekiah, there's this back and forth that keeps going where threats come and then what do I do? Threats come, what do I do? Threats come and I have to respond to threats. And I want you to see this. You know, we, we, we have all these different portions of scripture, but really in Hezekiah 19, starting in verse 14, it's really Hezekiah's response to the threats that were coming at him, the threats that were coming to him. So in 2 Kings 19, starting in verse 14, it says this, Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers, read it, and then went up to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. 
Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, Lord God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim. You are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You made the heavens and the earth. Listen closely, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Hear the words that Sennacherib has sent to mock the living God. Right? Sennacherib was the king of Assyria. Lord, it is true that the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire, for they were not gods made by human hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. Now, Lord our God, please save us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. For one, I love that this was Hezekiah's response. I love that when he received the threats from the enemy... His response was, I need to go meet with Jesus. I need to go meet with God. And he took the threats of the enemy and said, God, this is your kingdom. I know I'm stewarding this, but here's the threats of the enemy. Uh, Here's their paperwork. Here's the threats they just just labeled against us, sent up against us. What are we going to do about this? (laughs) And I love that Hezekiah is just honest with God. He's like, actually, God, it's, it's kind of true. They've destroyed these other nations. They've destroyed them. That's, not, that, that's fact. They've been devastating nation after nation after nation. Uh, and now we're here. God, please, please, please help us. Right? And this, this is the state that they're in. But when I look at this, you always have to look to God's response as well. Because this is the history that we have as believers. Our history is in here. You know, we have our own personal histories with God. We have our, our family history as well, which you can learn from and you can grow from. But this is part of our history as believers as well. As you've been grafted into the family of God, you are a child of God, this is your history. And you you begin to read these stories about what God did in the past and what he's going to do in the future. Come on, somebody. This is what God says to Hezekiah because he answers his response. And in short, God says, yeah, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to stand up to this king and show him who the God of Israel is. And it says this in 2 Kings 19, verse 35. It says, That night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and left. He returned home and lived in Nineveh. How, much, how many times would you love God to act that night? I love how it says that, that night, what night? Well, that day, <laughs> Hezekiah brought the threats before God, and that night, God showed up. That night, God broke into the Assyrian camp. It says the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord came and fought on behalf of Hezekiah and his people. He fought for them. And the Syrian army obviously wakes up the next day. 185,000 people were killed. I don't know about you, but I didn't didn't know that was possible. I didn't know that God could do that until I read my history. I didn't know how big I could dream. I didn't even know that God was capable of that, that he could do that until I read my history. And, And you know, for us as believers... How big we can dream is defined by the one who says what is possible. And I love this about our God because he says, with me, all things are possible, even this. Even the greatest enemies that are coming up against you can be defeated before you. They may have more people. They may be better looking. (laughs) They may be more talented. They may have overcome all the nations of the earth. But when it comes to you, watch what I'll do. Watch what I'll do. And for me, when I read my history as a believer and realize, oh my gosh, God showed up for Hezekiah, he's going to show up for me. And I love how this goes on because 
we, we know this about King Hezekiah, and anyone who's ever read the story of Hezekiah knows the next portion of scripture that I'm about to read to you. And in, in, in 2 Kings 20, it's this story that it says, in those days, in what days? In the days that they were in, struggling, what's going on? The, the enemies of the Assyrians coming against them. Hezekiah became terminally ill. Terminally ill. It doesn't say exactly what his disease is or sickness or whatever, but it was a terminal illness. And catch this. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Put your affairs in order, for you are about to die. You will not recover. Now, this is crazy because... I don't know about you, but that's not exactly an encouraging word from the Lord. <laughs> You're not like, yes, God spoke. It's like, no, this is not good. He said, put your affairs in order. Get ready to die. And obviously we know in, in today's day, the Spirit of God has been poured on, on all humanity and God can speak to you and God can speak to me. But in those days, God spoke through the prophets like Isaiah to the people. So when Isaiah showed up and spoke to King Hezekiah, it was as if God was showing up and saying, I, I have a word for you. And King Hezekiah prays this prayer. He says, please, Lord, remember how I have walked before you faithfully and wholeheartedly and have, had, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And I love this next portion of scripture. In verse 4 it says, Isaiah had not yet gone out of the inner court when the word of the Lord came to him again. Meaning God spoke to him again. God heard the cry of Hezekiah and said, I got to respond to that. He says this, Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord God of your ancestor David says, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Look, I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the Lord's temple. I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. I don't know about you, but until I'd read this portion of scripture, I didn't know that that's how it worked. I didn't realize that God could say in the same breath almost... You're going to die. Actually, you know what? I'm going to change my mind and extend your life 15 years. You talk about the power of our God. You talk about how how life is literally held in his hands. And you say, I'll I'll extend your life just because I I can. Because I'm going to honor the prayer that you prayed. I love how Hezekiah didn't pray specifically for 15 years. But God said, I'm going to grant you 15 years extension on your life. That's incredible. And you you, you come back to our question, how big can you dream? Well, the God that I serve holds life in his hands and he can extend life and he can take away life. This is who our God is. And if that's my dad, if I fully believe that I'm a son of God and that my father in heaven can destroy armies, can extend lives. What can he not do for me? You know, for me, dreams have always been a, uh, a really big part of my life. <laughs> Ever since I was young, I always wanted to play professional soccer, and I got to go and do that. And, and God, God did some amazing, amazing things in my life during that season and has, has obviously matured me and grown me. And um, Now I get to be the pastor at Zeal and get to do all this. And there was a portion of scripture during my, during my professional career that God really spoke to me a lot about. And it was Psalm 37 verse four. And it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But what I've often found about that portion of scripture is that the more I delight myself in the Lord, take joy in him, things are coming out of my heart that I didn't know were there. Really good things. Dream things, big things, businesses or ideas or or whatever it might be. And God's just been stirring up in my heart over the last few years, this thing and then this thing and then this thing. And I, I felt like I just wanted to share some of that with you today because I believe God is restoring dreams in this hour, in this time. And I always want to share with you some of these things. You know, one of the things, obviously, with my career, playing soccer, and my wife was a college soccer player as well, and 
we, we worked for a friend of ours who, who ran a business, a soccer player development business. And we worked for him for about three or three or four years. And God put it on my heart one day in prayer to go sit with this individual and, and ask, can I buy this business from you? Can I purchase this business from you? I really want to run it. I really think I can. I think you can do an amazing job with this. And so, you know, I, I did what a, a lot of people do. I, I, I called him up and said, hey, can we have lunch? This is what I want to talk about. This is what I want to discuss. And I went down, drove down to Massachusetts, and I sat with my friend and said, hey, you know what? Um, you recently moved. You're pretty far from the business now. Can I buy this business from you? Just flat out right? I, I want to buy the business from you. We weren't even talking price or anything at that point. It's like, I want to buy the business from you. Cause that's what I felt like God told me to do. And I just remember my friend sitting there and saying, you know what? Uh, it's not for sale. I, I appreciate you coming, but, um, it's not for sale. And I remember thinking like, wow, that was weird. And I got in the car and I drove home and I was thinking like, God, I feel like you asked me to go talk to him about buying his business. And now all of a sudden it's, it's just not even for sale. Well, that kind of stinks. And about two weeks later, this individual called me on the phone and said, hey, you know what? The business isn't for sale. Um, I I actually just want to give it to you. And I was like, what? Are you kidding? And we took this business and we've been running this soccer player development business in New Hampshire for the last three years and growing it. And God's been amazing to us and providing for us. And that was just an amazing dream that welled up in our hearts that we took on. You know, another thing that God just began to stir up in me was, was real estate, real estate investment. About two or three years ago, God just really put it on my heart to start learning and growing in the area of real estate. And you know, for me, like growing up, I just thought everyone had one home and only the really rich people could have more than one home. I, I just thought that's how it worked. I, I, I didn't know any other way. And as I started diving into this, God started giving me thoughts and ideas about real estate investment. And Kayla and I, my wife, we've been studying and learning and growing and asking and learning lots of questions and sitting with people who've been doing it and this and that. And, you know, today we own two homes and we're looking to buy a third one now. And it's, it's like God's, God's stirring ideas and dreams in our heart. And do you know what? Do you know what? It's like, I love it. I love it. I, I never knew that that was even in my heart, that that was a passion of mine was real estate. I thought it was so cool. You know, and another thing that, God's been stirring in me is to actually start a foundation <clears throat> for people, and I'll give some give some context for this. That if you know my background, you know that before I knew Jesus, I I had two abortions. It, w- it was a tragic time in my life. I was far from the Lord. I didn't know Jesus, uh, and I had two abortions. And obviously, like, let's not glamorize what that is. Um, it's essentially you're you're paying someone to kill your children, right? You just think of like that is the opposite of the heart of a father, the heart of a mother, that you would go through something like that. But God took me on years of healing through that process and through that journey. And, you know, one day, Kaylin and I, we were, we were praying, and she said, you know, I feel like God's given me something uh, for you and for us, really, as a, as a couple. She said, I, I feel like the culmination of your healing journey with the two abortion experiences is that you'd go from abortion to actually adopting two children. So you'd go from abortion to adoption. And this is literally, God started speaking to me about starting this foundation, starting this organization that takes people through a process of recovery who were once in a state of, I've had an abortion, to I'm going to adopt a children. Now that is a, that is an absolute God miraculous moment where you could actually, God could take an individual who actually paid for their children to be killed to I'm willing to adopt and take into my home and be a father to, a mother to, someone who didn't want their children or couldn't care for their children. That's an amazing place. And I just, I just felt like he began to speak to me about traveling and encouraging and speaking to people and, and, and have, helping people through their process. You know, obviously in America, we've had tens of millions of abortions, and that's a lot of people. 
But what if every single one of those people could actually have a heart transformation that God gets in there, brings healing, brings wholeness, brings restoration, that they could actually be whole and healthy and actually adopt someone into their life? I think that would be absolutely amazing. You know, one of the other things that God's been speaking to me about is the idea of starting something called the Dream Lab. And I remember sitting with uh, the mayor not too long ago, the mayor of Manchester, and it was probably about a year or two ago, and we were at this meeting, it was a faith uh, leaders meeting, and we were sitting, and the, the mayor called this meeting, and we had this round table at the end, and there was a bunch of different round tables, but I actually ended up being at the same table as her. Um, and they threw out these questions, these questions that they wanted people to answer. And they said, you know, if money wasn't a factor, what would you start? What would you do? Uh, and I remember sitting at this meeting and hearing some of the ideas. And to be honest, none of the ideas were that great. And I felt like God stirring in me this, this dream that he uh, had put on my heart. And I said, you know, what I would do is I would start something called the Dream Lab. And, you know, I think it's, a, it's, it's proven that people who have hope hope in their hearts, hope of a better future, hope of a dream, will often say no to things that will get in the way of and hurt their chances of that dream being fulfilled. Like it could be drugs, um, it could be criminal activity, it could be all kinds of different things that you say no to because I'm going after something. I have a hope of a better future. I have a hope of a dream. I said, you know, what I really want to do is I want to come alongside young people and just people in general and start the dream lab where you can actually partner people, partner young people, who have a dream with people who can actually help them fulfill their dream. I was like, that, that's what I would do. I would help young people and come alongside them so that they can actually have a process to fulfilling their dreams. Not just, I have a dream, hopefully it happens someday. No, 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 we're gonna actually come alongside you and help, tr- to help, help take actual, real, actionable steps. And I was like, I, I see this in every single school, every single elementary school, middle school, university, uh, high school in, in the Manchester area and growing beyond and connecting them to amazing business people, amazing um, religious leaders. Amazing, whatever your dream is, that we're gonna connect you to people who are doing it and we're gonna move forward in that, in that space. And you know, when I was praying about this, about the dreams that God's placed in the hearts of people, you know, God, God says something to me very specific. He said, Phil, what I'm doing in this season is I'm turning water into wine. I'm turning water into wine. He said, I'm making what's common and turning it into something that's uncommon. And I was like, well, God, what does that even have to do with dreams? Like, what is it? What are you talking about? And he said, it's not uncommon for someone to have a dream. That's not uncommon. I think especially here in America. If you go to different countries, that's a different story. But many people in America may have a dream. We have this literally, this, this terminology, the American dream. It's not uncommon to have a dream. Or, or it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's common to have a dream, but it's uncommon to see dreams fulfilled. You know, m- many people would say I have a dream, but it's, it's different when somebody says my dream has been fulfilled. I've been walking it out. I'm living it out and I'm on to the next dream at this point. But I, I believe in this hour that God is stirring up dreams in the hearts of people. God is, as the people of God delight themselves in God, that the dreams that he's placed in your heart and my heart are coming to the surface and we're taking actionable steps to see the dreams that God's placed in us be fulfilled in the world around us. Come on, our God, our Father, determines what's possible. He determines alone how big you can dream. My dreams are not limited by my circumstances. My dreams are defined by my Father who says all things are possible. So my question for you is what dreams have you not even acted on yet because you actually don't believe they're possible? What are those dreams? What are those thoughts? And I'm going to pray for you in just a second because I believe that God is stirring up dreams in the hearts of people right now and saying, it is possible. So God, I thank you for every single person who was able to tune in today. God, I bless them right now. I bless you that you would delight yourself in the Lord in this time, in this hour, in this season. And in this time, as God is moving in and through you, that the dreams that God's placed in your heart will be stirred up and you will begin to move out. You will begin to take action because you believe that our God, our Father, says all things are possible. 
through him who gives me strength. So God, we believe you at your word. We believe that you place dreams in our hearts to see them fulfilled. I love how David says that God, he literally says that I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living and it will see you move. God, I thank you for dreams to be stirred up right now here in this season. I bless everyone who's watching today. I bless you. I bless your dreams. I bless your heart. I bless your delight in the Lord in this next season. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. We love you guys. Have a great week.